Hello, history friends, and welcome back to the Cabinet of Curiosity, where this week we were about to investigate the history of electrotherapy. And then we kind of got sucked through a series of research wormholes, and we ended up in the history of cameras, and now we're still doing a history of cameras, but also ghosts. Specifically, ghosts on camera, or spirit photography. If we want to talk about spirit photography, then first we have to talk about spiritualism. Spiritualism was a pseudo-religious philosophical movement very popular in the 19th century, based on the idea that the dead could contact the living and offer their wisdom and guidance through spiritual channelers or mediums. It was an informal movement compared to the rigid and hierarchical religious structures of the day because it allowed ordinary people, like you and me, to contact the supernatural without the intermediary of an official priest, church, or temple. It was also, it should be said, buckets of fun with seances and ectoplasm and levitating furniture and table wrapping, and it was steadily growing in popularity and influence throughout the 19th century. But spirit photography didn't really emerge until the 1860s. This could be for any number of reasons. Perhaps daguerreotypes weren't made of the right materials to capture the spiritual essences. Perhaps the ghosts of the 1840s and 50s were just above taking selfies with the living. Ooh, boundaries are important. It should be noted that the introduction of wet plate photography in the 1850s made photographs cheaper, faster, and more convenient than ever before. Then, between 1861 and 1865, the American Civil War swooped in and killed about 750,000 people, mostly young men, leaving an entire nation in mourning and desperate for comfort and certainty about the afterlife. Enter a man named William Howard Mumler, amateur chemist, inventor, and peddler of homemade dyspepsia cures among other things. Miller worked as an engraver in Boston, Massachusetts, and became interested in amateur photography around 1861. One afternoon, Mumler was working alone in the photography studio, developing a self-portrait. And then, the image upon the glass plate showed not only him, but the ethereal specter of a young girl, made of light, standing just behind him in the photograph. Mumler showed the photograph around and claimed that he recognized the girl as his own cousin, who had died 12 years previously. His account was published in two Boston spiritualist newspapers and immediately blew up like an overfilled dirigible. Spiritualists cited his story as incontrovertible proof that one, the afterlife existed, and two, the deceased were taking vacations from it to visit their loved ones in photography studios. Mumler opened up his own photography studio and was soon producing dozens of photographs of the dearly departed. The photos sold like morbid hotcakes and at a hefty price. One sitting cost between five and ten dollars. This at a time when your average unhaunted photograph would run you about 25 cents. For some context on prices in that era, in 1869, an American farm laborer in New England earned approximately one dollar and 75 cents a day. That five to ten dollars, by the way, did not guarantee that a spirit would appear. That was just what you paid to sit for the photograph. Mumler became so good at reaching the spirits that he could even do it by mail. For a mere seven dollars and fifty cents, you could send a written description of your loved one to Mumler, who would then contact and photograph the spirit in his studio and send you the prints. Now I'm sure you'll agree this all sounds pretty shady. And it's easy to see Mumler's customers as old-timey, ignorant rubes easily fooled by a cunning con man. But when we do that, we aren't taking a couple of things into account. Thing one! The 19th century. We think of ourselves living in this unprecedented era of rapid change and uncertainty that the world has never seen. But living between 1800 and 1900 was like riding a century-long roller coaster through a hurricane of chaos and innovation. It seemed like every week somebody was inventing or discovering something that was going to completely transform your life. Machines could shoot invisible messages through wires across continents and under oceans that once took months to sail across. 
There were machines that could capture the energy of a human voice in a series of grooves and then reproduce it as though the person, living or dead, was right there in the room with you. And there were machines that could perfectly reproduce the image of a human being and hold the person in the stasis of that instant. Forever. It was like magic. So really, why not machines that could see ghosts? Thing two, human memory is a terrible way to remember things. Figures of the deceased were often faint or blurry, and the photographs themselves were actually quite small. A lot of them were only about two by three inches. In this era, it was very unlikely that you would have another reliable picture of the person sitting around, especially if that person had died 10 or 20 or even 30 years previously. Did you really remember what shape your cousin's nose was? How tall was grandpa, anyway? Sure, that blurry image looked a little short to be your dead wife, but if you just squinted hard enough, you could definitely see a resemblance. Thing three, grief. People believed because they wanted to. There were some people who would have bought spirit photographs as a curiosity, but a lot of Mumler's customers were bereaved people people who were desperate to see their loved one one more time. And that desperation made them pretty suggestible. And of course, not everyone did believe. There were plenty of skeptics who questioned spiritualism in general, and Mumler in particular, but none of them could tell exactly how he did it. In fact, another photographer named James Wallace Black came to Mumler's studio to observe his process. Black was famous in Boston photographic circles, and he was so certain that he would figure out Mumler's trick that he laid a bet of $50. Black sat for a portrait and examined the glass plates and the camera and the room, and he even sat there and watched as Mumler developed the photograph and concluded that it was all real. After all, there was no way that Mumler could be fooling him. The news of Black's experiment spread all over Boston. For the next few years, Mumler's business did really well, but then things started to get a little wobbly. A young man visiting the photography studio one day recognized the ghost of a young woman in one of Mumler's photographs. Unfortunately, he did not recognize it as a dead person, but as his very own, very much alive wife, who coincidentally had sat for a photograph with Mumler only a week previously. A Dr. H. F. Gardner, an ardent spiritualist, actually recognized the person standing behind him in his own portrait as someone who was, again, very not dead. People began to accuse Mumler of fraud and possibly even of breaking into the homes of customers at night in order to steal images of the dead to copy them. The accusations began to mount up and eventually damaged Mumler's reputation so badly that in 1868 he finally packed up his glass plates and his silver nitrate and swore never to defraud the grieving public ever again. kidding. He moved to New York City. And there he did uh, just fine. He made enough money in his first six months in New York City to buy another photography studio, and he attracted hundreds of new customers. Unfortunately, he also attracted the attention of the chief marshal and mayor of New York City, who had him arrested for fraud and larceny in 1869. A hearing was held in April of that year to decide whether Mumler's case deserved a trial. And it went on for weeks. The photographers testified on both sides, some attesting that they had observed Mumler's process carefully and found absolutely no evidence of fraud, and others explaining that there were dozens of ways that the photographs could have been faked. The defense pulled up Mumler's customers, including a former New York Supreme Court judge who said that not only did he speak to the dead, but he often consulted them in his rulings. The prosecution called P.T. Barnum. Yes, that P.T. Barnum, who testified at the hearing as an expert on deceits and hoaxes, and even produced his own image of himself with the spirit of Abraham Lincoln to prove how easy it was to produce one of these photographs. Through all of this, Mumler was steadfast in his innocence, maintaining that he just took the photographs and sometimes the spirits showed up. And since no one could prove exactly how he got all of those supposedly dead people into his photographs, the case was dismissed on May 3rd, 1870.
1869. However, though Mumler was spared a trial, his reputation was again in tatters and he owed thousands of dollars in legal fees. So he moved back to Boston, where he continued to take spirit photographs out of his mother-in-law's living room. In fact, that is where he took his most famous photograph of all, a portrait of none other than Abraham Lincoln's widow, Mary Todd Lincoln, with her husband standing behind her. Mumler died in poverty in 1884. In his obituary, there is hardly any mention whatsoever of his supernatural pursuits. But of course, the end of Mumler did not mean the end of spirit photography. Spiritualism waxed and waned through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, predictably following mass death events. The first, as we mentioned, was in the 1860s at the end of the American Civil War, but then again in France after the War of 1870, and then, predictably, after the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. In the 1920s, a photographer and medium named William Hope made a name for himself in Britain, holding seances and taking photographs similar to Mumler's, although, as you can see, of markedly lower quality. Hope was the head of a group of six spirit photographers and had many supporters, including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle had had an interest in psychic phenomena and spiritualism since the 1880s. He even wrote a book in 1922 titled The Case for Spirit Photography as a reaction to Hope's critics. And there were many. Unlike Mumler, Hope was publicly debunked several times, but continued to take spirit photographs and have seances until his death in 1933. Mumler and Hope were fairly obvious frauds, but to this very day, people are taking photographs which purport to be images of demons and ghosts. Are they tricks of the light? Are they vagaries of the photographic process? Or are they fleeting images of beings reaching out to us? from the other side. Thank you for watching Cabinet of Curiosity, and please tune in next time when we are actually really going to talk about electrocuting yourself back to perfect health. Halloween.